essentially a great You see, Nikon in 1704, in this very remarkable book, which of course I didn't read, I know that it's remarkable because many people have read it and they, they say so. Look, I don't want to read that kind of English language. Let's be honest. So in this book, look at it. The attractions of gravity, magnetism, and electricity reach to very sensible distances and so have been observed by vulgar eyes. And there may be other which reach to so small distances and escape observation. This is really remarkable. I mean, like 300 years ago, he was so brilliant to, to, to actually observe this. In fact, that is the story, basically. Okay? There are, there are two other forces, strong and weak forces, that work below one family or 10 to the minus 15 meter distances, without which no structure in the universe can actually exist. That's important. Okay? These forces are, are really shy. They are there, but without them actually we can we cannot have an apple, we cannot really have anything. So we have to understand these three forces. Now, in order to understand why they are so shy, meaning why we don't really see them at macroscopic scales or even atomic scale, like an iceberg, uh, we have to understand the concept of mass in terms of quantum physics. That is important. Okay? So mass is essentially a quantum mechanical thing that, that we have to understand. Now, it will be related to broken symmetry. The universe essentially is like a piece of magnet. Now, this is an interesting picture. When, when I was growing up, when you actually showed me something like this, I would call this is not the symmetric phase. This is the symmetric phase, but that's not true. Okay? Here, here, certain orientation is picked, so this is non-symmetric. So if you have broken the symmetry, if there was a fire alarm in this room, you would have a perfectly symmetric combination, everybody running in a certain direction initially. And then they go up. So this is symmetric, this is non-symmetric. It turns out the universe started in a very hot phase, and then no structure exists in that hot phase. It's pretty much like the following. You cannot have a mountain in the sun, which is hot. You can have a mountain here. In the very early universe, you basically have nothing, including the, the proton, or the nucleus, or the atom. Then after the universe sort of cooled down, structures started to appear, and these four forces essentially repeat. Okay? Now, here's the picture. So initially you basically have no structure, then again atoms are formed and the galaxies and so on. Okay? So this is coming from a hot phase to, to symmetric phase to this non-symmetric phase essentially uh, gives the structures and it turns out during this process certain choices were made okay it's pretty much like cooling down a ferromagnet and then you are choosing a direction in space basically okay magnetism appears at low temperature at low temperature so it doesn't appear like at, at a thousand degrees okay in a piece of iron so certain direction is chosen so there is a symmetry relation. Symmetry means the following. The system, the physical system, doesn't change if you change the point of observation, essentially. And uh, uh, that's what happened. Maybe I'll come back to that, but let's move on. I will, I will start with a bad stuff. In fact, the notion of mass is a very subtle one and not yet exactly understood, I mean, even today. Okay? Now, what remarkable progress has been made? Well, Mass really exists for all practical purposes. Mass is this thing, one kilogram at part. Okay, that's what it is. So uh, that, there is no other practical definition of that you can do. But I think we can understand right now the mass of this object in terms of quantum mechanics. Okay? So that is what I'm going to focus on. Now, a brief summary of what we know. Uh, we see 4% of the total mass and energy in the universe. C means it interacts with light. Okay? 
Now, the 4% is stuff like you and I in this part, okay? Now, 96% only shows itself in gravity. So, there is some energy and mass there that doesn't interact with light, but it gravitates, okay? So, I will not talk about this 96%, okay? That needs another explanation, another... Well, we have no idea about where this 96% comes, so I won't pretend anything about that, okay? But we need this wisdom, okay? If Einstein's theory is correct, general theory of relativity, we really need that. that. Now, concentrate on the 4% star, okay? Or the atom. Basically, this 4% is a collection of hydrogen atoms. Now, mass then, mass must be a property of the hydrogen atom. Essentially, if you are searching for mass, it should be a property of the hydrogen atom that you can understand. But the hydrogen atom, if you concentrate on it, it's actually empty space, really, okay? So one angstrom, that's the one is 10 meters, and the photon is really tiny. And the mass of the electron, mass of the electron is basically only about one over, let's say, 1900 mass of the hydrogen atom. So electron doesn't really carry the mass of the, the atom. Proton is so small, really small in radius, charge radius if you like, you can fit like 10 to the 14 proton inside, inside the hydrogen atom. I mean, then you, you should think of the atom really in an empty space, according to this, this picture. But of course, the mass should come from the proton. Mass of the atom should come from the proton. Now concentrate on the proton. Proton basically has like three quarts, eight coulombs, they are always at home, meaning there are other things that pop up and disappear, but these guys are always there. You can remember 11 from the football team. So there are 11 members inside a proton, and basically, proton is also an empty space because quarks, these guys, are point like and gluons, they, they are also point like. By the way, quarks have very little mass. These are known from scattering experiments, okay? So where is the mass of the proton? Gluons are massless. Quarks have very little mass. Now where is the mass? We are looking for the mass. We came down to distance of that and all. We cannot even find the mass. Well, it turns out the quarks are fast moving, and so they have energy, basically. And the gluons, without a mass, but they have like energy. Electric field square, for example, in this row, give the energy of the electromagnetic field, E square plus B square, electric field square, magnetic field square. You have the same thing inside the proton, so essentially the mass of the proton comes from the kinetic energy of the quarks and the binding energy of massless things. You can say that 99% of the mass of the atom comes from motion and binding energy of almost massless quarks and gluons, okay? So that, that is 99%, that is important. So that is kinetic energy, okay? You look at the universe, you see 4% uh, of the mass stars and basically kinetic energy and binding energy. Now, this 1% comes from the mass of the electron and quarks. This 1%, even though it's small, is important, and we shall see, okay? So, in the 60s, it was conjectured, conjectured by, by those gentlemen that mass of fundamental particles, point-like particles are fundamental particles that we have microscopic equations for, okay? We don't have equations for every kind of object, like a proton, for example. It does not have microscopic equations. So, there are only certain particles that I will mention which have microscopic equations that we can work with, uh, and they are point electrons, quarks, etc. And the mass of these objects should come from the interaction with a field that fills the universe, okay? So that 1% mass of the observable mass is related to the interaction of fundamental particles with the heat field. So it is the interaction rate, okay? Now, how do you prove, prove such a thing? Basically, the proof can be done 
if you can excite that field, take, take an excitation of that field, which will become a particle, if you can find that, then you can prove, prove that thing and that one, hopefully prove it. Now, let me go back. Mass according to Newton. In Principia, basically, well, he was a very smart man. So he started in his book, the first definition is mass and who reads the first sentence, right? And then, uh, basically, he uses this a lot. The quantity of matter is the measure of the same arising from its density and bulk conjunctly. I couldn't fit it in here, but he said, I will call this mass. Okay? That's what he says. So density and bulk. Okay? Let's see. So Newton said mass is density times the volume, basically. Okay? What is density then? Density is mass divided by volume. Well, smart move, it doesn't convey any information. I mean, so Newton just said it in the first sentence, and then he used it, and people used it for 300 years. Okay? But we, we are using it, for sure, but what is the problem with that? I mean, so what? Take mass as a primary concept and be happy with it. You take electric field like that, electric charge like that. Why not just take it as a property of an existing, existing object? We cannot do that, right, as I will see. We have no other option but to understand mass in terms of more primary objects. And today the paradigm is interaction is really with the paradigm. I mean, we understand, we say we understand things, but we can understand them in terms of interaction, essentially. Okay? Now, without understanding the mass as a primary concept, we cannot understand the existence of an atom. Even the simplest hydrogen atom, let alone any atom above, let's say, heavier than hydrogen, I will explain. And we, can we cannot understand how the sun keeps on burning, because there is no neutron available, free neutron, and the sun is making helium out of protons. Helium has neutrons, so where does this neutron come from? Without understanding this, you cannot really understand how the sun shines. Okay? Now, this discovery of the Higgs boson, I think I can say discovery, really. So, on July last year, uh, a particle with mass 130 times the mass of the hydrogen atom was known. It's like an osmium atom. Look at the periodic table, it's huge. Well, it's point like most probably, but it has a lot of mass. Okay? Now, it has no electric charge, it has no spin, it leaves about 10 to the minus 22 seconds. Okay? There are people in this room who can measure really small time scales. I don't think they can measure that. Then the problem is how do you know how long it leaves? The deep, actually, it's an important question, and experimentally, something fascinating is going on. Okay? Hopefully, I will explain something. Okay? This is really big news. I mean, I'm not exaggerating anything. This is honestly big news. I mean, we have understood 1% of the mass of the 4%, but, as I will explain, we have under understood, really, the, the volume of material. I, I will come to that. More than mass, we have understood the volume. I mean, this all couldn't be without the picture. You know, how about the discovery rate? This is an accelerator, of course, you don't see this. This is like 100 meters down the ground, 27 kilometers. They accelerate protons and they collide them. Okay? So their speed is very close to the speed of light. This one is ninth digit. Okay? So they are actually moving very fast. Now what happens here is that they accelerate these particles. In each beam, they call it a beam, okay? There are about three thousand bunches of seven centimeters long and very thin, like your hair, okay? They collide. They collide at this point. Most of them meet, meet each other. Only 20 of them collide. And then <coughs> they shuttle it so many times that you get lots of pollution. One billion pollution per second. You must say, why do they collide this thing? I mean, take one, do one pollution, and then live with it. It turns out it will give you more.
information, as I said. Okay? So, so you need lots of collisions and they, but what is what they have been doing? They have actually collided, they had collisions about end of March, 25 times 10 to the power 14 collisions. Okay? How many collisions? Now, one out of these one million collisions has a chance to produce heat, converting kinetic energy to mass. Okay? It may not, it's just a probability. Okay? In quantum mechanics, generically, you cannot tell the outcome of an experiment with 100% certainty or with 0% certainty. There is a number that you can assign between 0 and 100, and this is the way it is. Okay? Nobody can tell you the exact outcome of a single experiment. That's why you have to do like billions and billions and billions of collisions to get probabilities that match with theoretical predictions. Now, I have really worked hard to write this kind of thing. Okay. At low energy quantum physics, okay, non-relativistic quantum physics, Energy is not enough to create new particles, so that's called low energy. That all the information is contained in the wave function. Okay? So there is a function whose square will give you probabilities and from which you can get any kind of measurable thing. Okay? That is basically quantum mechanics. But what happens in non relativistic quantum mechanics is whatever you have initially doesn't change at the end. That could be some slight change of energy exchange or so but no new particles can be created. You scatter such particles, non-relativistic particles, nothing serious happens. But at high energy scattering, kinetic energy of the incoming particles leads to the creation of new particles if certain conservation rules are satisfied. Like electric charge is known to be conserved, you have to conserve that. There are certain other conserved rules. Other than that, you can take kinetic energy and then turn it into matter. Okay? So that is the thing for that in this experiment. Now, wave function description in such a case is not good enough because wave function is referring to an object which doesn't disappear or it can, no, no, no new particles are created. But this is lengthy. So one finds a way to compute probability of getting some particles out of colliding particles. Trust me, the theory tells you the following. If you collide particles, like two protons, at a certain energy, okay, we have a nice theory to compute the probabilities of the outcomes. What are the outcomes? It is just innumerable, actually. There are like billions of things that can come out, but we can compute the probability, okay? Now think about what probability means in this case, and then that's why you have to you have to do a lot of checks to, to actually see that your theory is correct. Okay? For example, say I give you a dice which has 100 sides. I couldn't find a dice like that. 100 sides, okay? Now, how can you find the probabilities? Well, you have to throw it, right? You can assign an a priori probability, but it could be a lot of dice. You have to throw it many times. I say several thousand times to, to tell to, to, to actually assign the probability. In principle, you should throw it like infinitely many times. Okay. In quantum mechanics, we have basically loaded dices. Not each probability is the same. So essentially, we can calculate the outcome theoretically, but we don't know really the particles will actually obey what, what we have done unless we try it many times. That's why they collide it many, many times to realize the probability. Okay? Now, what is bad is the following. In classical dice rolling, you throw the dice and you see the outcome. In these experiments, you collide particles, something comes out, it disappears. Okay? And you are supposed to find what was there. Okay? It is pretty much like this. You've seen something here, okay? I record it and then put it on a tape and try to figure out if the person that I am interested in is 
that, okay, with the he or she sign, okay? It's pretty much like that. There is a data, it's a possible thing actually, you, you, you need to figure it out. It's very complicated, so back, which I will come. But what is important is, is the following. In quantum mechanics, we basically learned quite early on that mass must be considered something actually uh, quantum mechanical. Why? Here is, here is the reason. Consider a free electron, free, okay? You don't touch it, it, it does something, right? It goes from here to there. It can go from here to there. In the process, it can emit a photon and then take it back, okay? Well, you cannot see this, but it could happen. The rules of quantum mechanics allow this thing to happen. It could, it could do this twice, three times, four times, and so on. The question is, what do they actually refer to? Do they change anything observable? It turns out all these things actually shift the mass of the electron. The electron pretty much has a hard time moving around because it's interacting with itself through this process. So when you see something like this, you can think of, okay, some part of the mass of the electron is related to this picture. Well, why is that so? Well, I don't know why. I mean, that's a, this, this is the universe. It allows for you have electron photon interactions. When you allow that and if you observe, then you have this. Okay? It, it, it happens and <coughs> it has observed the thing. But fixed field. Now, this is important. Discovery of the Higgs particle through the existence of the <coughs> Higgs field. The Higgs particle itself, I wouldn't care. Okay? The particle doesn't live long enough to, for me to see, it doesn't do anything, but it actually shows that there is a Higgs field, which is the important thing. Okay? The particle appears and disappears. It doesn't give mass to the fundamental particle. The particle doesn't give mass. The Higgs field is the, the response, responsible thing here. The particle interact with it and it appears as a mass to our eyes, basically. It fills all the space with a constant field strength, 246 giga electron volt. Well, this is like mass. One giga electron volt is the mass of the electron, the proton. So it's like 246 times the mass of the, the proton. By the way, this is predicted. So uh, this is a number that you can predict. Well, depending on what you measure, of course, you measure something and you can predict this. Now, why do we have this? It goes back to the cooling of the universe. Just like the spin in a ferromagnet, a usual magnet, choose the direction when you cool them down, okay? In a magnet, they choose a direction. It turns out this Higgs field, essentially, you suddenly have a direction, it's a scalar field with no direction, it's like temperature, if you like, just after the Big Bang, gain this expectation value, filling all the universe. So you can think of an ether, okay? Filling all the universe, essentially, and that was formed basically in the initial phases of the universe. That part is called electronic symmetric energy. I have to be very honest. This did not happen. You could, have, you could imagine a universe where there's no heat field and nothing like that, but it turns out our universe went through this, this phase transition where the, where the scalar field found itself in a wrong place and then the minimum turned out to be uh, where it is a field strength. It's a uniform field strength. It's nice that it is uniform because you don't get more massive when you move from here to your house. Okay? It is filling all the universe like that. Okay, constant strength. Now, uh, mass of the fundamental particles, electrons, quarks, and electrons interact. So, electrons, quarks interact with the Higgs field, and that interaction at the lowest order is what we call the mass of these particles. There is a slight subtlety here which I cannot explain. Okay? It's actually like so that we have. Now, the radius of the atom, hydrogen atom, is inversely proportional 
with the mass of the electron. This is important. Okay? So you you can ask what determines the size of an atom? Well, basically it's not the nucleus, but for large nuclei, maybe a little bit contribution, but the mass of the electron determines that and the electric field strength, but the major thing is this. Now, I will get back to that. Electron and Higgs field interaction, you can, I have no picture for this, okay? It is, you have to imagine that there is a Higgs field, okay? So some field, like electric field or like temperature, but with no direction, and it interacts with particles, like that. Now, it also interacts with itself, and you can think of the mass of the Higgs field also comes from the interaction of the Higgs field with itself. There is also a small subtlety there. Higgs field can have a mass independent of the interaction, but maybe it will be placed when we get back to this. What I call fundamental particles is this. So these are really the, the building blocks of nature. Up quark and down quark, these are the most important things. The rest, the rest of the quarks, they are dead, they decay very fast. I mean, they live 10 to the minus 22, 23 seconds, and then they die, but theoretically they must be there, and they were predicted to be there, and they were found. I think I was an undergraduate student when this top quark was found. It was there in theory for 30 years, and then it was found. Okay? But these, these, these guys cannot form objects which live for long. Proton and neutron are composed of up and down quarks, and there is the electron here. So these are really the fundamental particles, and we have equations for them. That is important. Okay? We have equations for them. So this is also a difference. Now, these are the metal particles, if you like. These are the particles that are exchanged between these metal particles, and then we interpret this exchange as force, essentially. Okay? Now, even though this field is responsible only for the 1% of the mass of an atom, without this field, electron would be massless, so the atom cannot be formed. Its radius would be 1 over 0 infinity. So you cannot really have an atom without the Higgs field. Okay? So, the brain essentially co constitutes 2% of the mass of a human being. The heart is 0.3%. Uh, but they are important. As important, so this field is as important to the, to the universe as the heart for a person. By the way, I have to be... This particle is usually called God particle, but I would call it a heart particle. This is a better actual thing. Okay? Why not the brain particle? It is closer. So well, that wouldn't be romantic. Okay? So, <laughs> we have learned that. Now, decay, here is, here is the important thing. Decay of a neutron is really the key to understand. There is a particle that we have, half of our mass comes from our neutrons, and we have to understand the decay of this particle. Outside the nucleus, it has a life of 40 minutes. It decays. Inside the nucleus, it doesn't because essentially uh, its energy is not uh, good enough to, to disintegrate. So there is a neutron, it is converted into three particles. When I say this, some, some people say, why does it decay? It's a very good question. But actually, it is, as a question, it is as good as the following question. Why does an electron repel another electron? Okay? You can imagine a universe where everybody lives without interaction, right? Imagine a universe that nothing would really happen. It turns out in our universe, an electron would repel an electron, then you can explain it in terms of increase of entropy, for example. But I don't think that's an explanation. Here, again, I could tell you that this decays because after the decay, entropy has increased. Okay? There was one particle, now there are three particles going in other direction to convert momentum and so on. But I would like you to understand actually the following. Such a process is allowed, and we call it an interaction, weak interaction. Okay? Well, it's not like a force. Unfortunately, we say it's a force, 
But this is pretty much a process that is allowed in our universe. Now, here is what is important. The neutron decays, so you cannot find any neutrons in the radio velocity. Okay? But, how does the sun, for example, then burn, taking four protons, making a helium, which is a neutron? In it. And that neutron is stable. Now it turns out this is a very interesting process. One, two, three, four protons. Okay. Now they collide in 15 million degrees. They collide. In fact, they cannot collide in 15 million degrees, but they tunnel a lot via quantum mechanics. They tunnel close to each other. Okay. In 100 million degrees, they can collide. In a supernova, that half they can collide. But here they tunnel just nearby each other. Okay? And in one million years, for just one of them, what happens is that a neutron, a proton becomes a neutron. Okay? The first, the inverse of the process I have shown you. Okay? That happens so rare that if, if you have just two of them, do it, do this collision many times, the probability is that it will happen in one million years. Then, you get this proton and neutron here. If it happens to find a proton, there are protons around. In one second, it becomes helium-3. And if this guy finds another helium-3, that happens in one million years, eventually you get helium-4. So you can imagine that one day is prepared in one billion years. Well, there are 10 to the 57 protons inside the sun. They try this all the time. That's why you get you get light as it is. But what is important is that with weak interaction, that is decaying of a neutron, you can you can understand formation of atoms beyond hydrogen. Now, without neutrons, you cannot make that. The process of the process of neutron decay and the production is called weak interaction or weak force. But how does it work at the microscopic level? Microscopic means at the point like level, if you like, and you have equations for them. For a neutron, we don't have equations. You can keep in your mind that for any object that has a size, its size, we have no equations. Okay, that works at any energy. For protons, neutrons, whatever. We have really no we cannot define proper quantum mechanics for that. The neutron decay at the microscopic level is the following. Neutron has three quarks in it, and one of these quarks basically change flavor, if you like. It's a down quark, it becomes an up quark. It has a charge minus one over three, now its charge becomes two over three. Why does it do? Well, I told you, this is a process allowed in our universe. Through this process, okay, a particle called W boson is an and this star is very heavy. It has like 80 times more mass than the, the original neutron. So the neutron actually cannot create a particle like this, and this particle go around, goes around a long distance. It cannot do that. So this happens below 10 to the minus 15, 16, actually, at the level of 10 to the minus 17 meters. And then very immediately, this W particle becomes an electron and an antineutrino. This thing is very hard to detect, but we can detect it. Okay? So that is how you how you get a neutron become a proton. Now, it turns out W goes on that helps this decay is very heavy, and it is another factor to create the consistent theory, Z boson. And these particles must be really heavy. Okay? They are heavy. And they were they were measured. Now, um, without these particles, you can I told you, you cannot explain the star burn. Now they were predicted in 1960s, discovered in 1983 in a lab. Okay. Now they live again for that, 10 to the minus 23 seconds, but they have this important job of turning neutron into a proton or the other way around. In fact, the other way around is more important. 
Now, let's see. Standard model, the model that describes the interaction and the existence of all these particles is based on quantum field theory, which is based on quantum mechanics and special relativity. Okay? It only works for points like interactions. Hence, the particles are described by fields extended in space, but they interact at a point. They have no substructure. Interaction basically means destruction of coming particles, creation of new particles. So an electron comes in, it disappears, becomes a photon, becomes an electron. That's what we call interaction, okay? At that point. In between, they propagate freely. Now, quantum mechanics plus special relativity by itself demand that all the particles are labeled by two independent labels. This is important. Mass and speed. Okay? The consistency of the theory. This is kinematic consistency of the theory. Demand that the particles have two labels. What do I mean by this? They have two things attributes which do not change according to observers. Okay? This is important. Otherwise, you cannot do physics. If you don't find labels on particles, you cannot do physics, right? Mass and speed. This was proven in 1939. Uh, now I think it is actually right as So it allows mass to be greater than zero or zero. The spin could be zero, one over two, one in units of h bar. So this part, mass is a continuous variable, but spin turns out to be a discontinuous variable. For example, you cannot have a particle with spin 1.3. Why is that? Well, it turns out that that label is not consistent with observer in the time. You might say that you have measured that spin, but you cannot communicate with the other It doesn't mean anything. Okay? Now, here is the important thing. This is kinematics, and there is dynamics, which is quantum field theory. When these particles start to interact, okay, then it turns out these higher spin particles do not have a consistent quantum mechanics. What do I mean by that? You scatter them, certain particles are created there, and if you calculate the probabilities, you always get infinite or nonsensical results. So quantum field theory, which takes this kinematics and then allows the particles to interact, only works for this guy, this four, first four of them. Now, spin one of particles are the matter particles, spin one particle of a photon and W boson and Z0. Up to this point, we have no spin zero particle. X particle is a spin zero particle. There is quantum field theory for spin three over two, but it is not urgently needed. Okay? So no spin three over two particle has been found. Spin two particle is relevant for gravity, but it doesn't have quantum mechanics, so this is a big problem. Now, quantum field theory also dictates how these particles interact. I find this very really fascinating. Okay? The theory tells you that certain particles have to exist, okay, or they can exist, and then the theory also tells you that you cannot actually arbitrarily define interaction between these particles. The interaction is dictated by the theory, and there are, in four dimensions, three plus one dimensional space, there are only four viable quantum field theory. Actually, the standard model is, is, is that. Now, I told you already this. It turns out, this is important, it turns out quantum field theory demands that there are no dimensions for parameters, such as the mass of an electron in the basic equation. And this is the most important thing. You see that an electron has mass, you see that W boson has loss of mass, but in the equations, you cannot write any mass to that. In fact, if you look at quantum field theory, just look at the equation of it. You can never understand the size of a nucleus, the size of an atom, because it's not there, okay? It is 
it is scale independent if you like. For me, uh, if it is scale independent, then any size is possible. That just means you have no size limitation. It's not that. Maybe so we are basically in a great trouble because we cannot form the proton, which is a size and mass, and the atom because the electron has mass. Those only bosons have mass. Now here is here is the big deal, really. The theory doesn't accommodate masses that you, you measure in the lab and then put into the equation. There is no such thing. Okay. Now, what, by the way, what would happen if you take masses and plug them to the, into the equations? You get a ridiculous result. Okay? Basically, what do I mean by that? You scatter particles, you compute the probabilities, you get numbers more than one. Okay? That is not acceptable. There are two exceptions to this. The mass of the Higgs field is allowed. Okay? It could be zero or it could be some number. The theory is okay with that. It, it, the scalar particle is not very really capricious. It's a scalar particle which, which doesn't have much, much uh, internal degrees of freedom. So you can you can put a mass into the equation for the Higgs field, and you can put the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field. Meaning, meaning, in your equations, you can put Higgs field to have some non-zero vanishing value in this group or zero. Okay? That's acceptable. All of them are acceptable for the Higgs field. But they are not required. You could put zero, or you could put uh, you could put zero for both of them. Now, from the vacuum value of the Higgs field, one cooks up all the masses of other particles. Okay? You cannot put a mass to the electron with your hand, but then you allow the Higgs particle to interact with the electron. That appears to your eye basically as a mass. Okay? It gives inertial matter. What you call, for example, the resistance of an electron to force in you know, inertial thing is its interaction with the Higgs field and the funny stuff that it does that I have shown. Now what, what is good is mass of a fundamental particle, uh, electron and quark is 246 times some number smaller than one. Okay? In terms of the electron loss. Now some number here is a number that you have to get from experiments. That we cannot predict. The mass of the electrons, the mass of the quark, cannot be predicted in the standard model. It is also a big question. Can you predict that? Okay? But in order to predict, you have to predict this number, which is a dimensionless number. It's called the Yukawa calculate. Basically, we don't know why an electron interacts with this field, but a photon doesn't interact with this field. Okay? That's the question. Or why a quark interacts with the Higgs field and gets like 10 MeV of mass or 2 whatever MeV of mass, but the electron gets only half MeV of mass. Okay? Now, how about the mass of a proton? Let's go back because this is often misunderstood. I told you already, I, I thought this, that was a brief summary, so let me go very quickly. Proton is not a fundamental particle again. It's a bound, it is an atom of a strong interaction. Okay, it's an atom basically of a different field. Strong interaction, not one for electro dynamics. And these quarks basically and gluons give, give the mass, and that's what I already told you. Now, here is the confinement issue. The problem is that quarks and gluons cannot leave the proton, they are permanently confined, and the the question of why they are confined in to 10 to the minus 15 meters is a big question. Why not like a half a century? Okay. It would be nice if we, had, we could see the curve like this, and then we understood everything. Because the theory doesn't tell you that, okay? Well, it turns out there is a number, but we have no idea of 
you cannot compute what such that number will be. It's a big problem. If you compute it, there will be a million dollar claims to this price and guarantee on the technology. Trust me, because this is this is a big question. Okay? Why? Essentially, the loans interact work and loans interact in such a strong way that we have no calculation techniques other than putting them on a the computer, discretizing the proton and doing some simulation. Okay, forget the mass for a second. What is the volume? Can you give a quantum mechanical description of volume? And I don't want to exaggerate, but X is the particle which is very responsible for the volume of the object. Okay, this is, this is the explanation. When you look at an object, we actually see its volume, right? Unless you push the object around, from, from here I see your volume, the cross-section, but then I look in different directions, I see the volume. Now what is the origin of volume? Because light, visible light comes in, interacts with its electric type of moments of your atoms, and then it comes and does the same thing with electric type of moments of my eye, and I see your volume. Now why does an object have volume? Why not zero volume? Because everything is made of point like objects. Okay? Why not take no volume? Uh, basically, uh, volume of an object is mostly determined by the volume of an atom, of course, and the spacing between the atoms. Can we ask why does an atom have a volume? And why there is interatomic spacing? In classical physics, an atom would have no volume. Okay? The electron is going in a primary first, zero volume. But on the average, the atom basically has this much, much volume, the hydrogen atom. And as we just saw, this radius cube squared volume is related to the finite radius of the atom, and that finite radius is explained by the mass of the electron, which comes with the interaction of the Higgs field. Okay? So if that thing, for example, is Zero, you would have an infinite size atom. Well, infinite size atom is non existent. Interatomic spacing comes from the fact that electrons don't like to be near to other electrons. How the exclusion principle, which comes from causality, and the fact that you cannot change history. It is remarkable that you have volume because basically the theory does not allow you to change history. For that, kill your grandmother, father. And that is related to all the exclusion principles, and the fact that your electrons right now interact with the Higgs field in this way. Okay? That gives you the volume. Now, both mass and the volume of an object have only quantum mechanical explanation. This is very important. Okay? If you find any other expl explanation, that just share it. Okay, very quickly. The, the experiment is a very complicated one, and that, that could be many, many discussions. Protons are collided in 7,000 times the mass, the energy is just 7,000 times the mass of the proton. Okay? Now, why 7,000? Because the Higgs particle is 125 giga electron long. Why 7,000? It turns out, I already told you, we have no equations for a proton, and protons interact with protons in such a way that when they are close, the gluons interact. Okay? So out of that 7,000 giga electron volts, some part of the energy must be imparted to the gluons, and then it becomes top quarks, and then it becomes the Higgs particle. It's a very complicated thing when you cataract with protons. You get a Higgs. You may not, by the way, get a Higgs. This is just a probability. There are some other probabilities. Forget them. Now, Peter Higgs just recently wrote something. My life as a bosom. Well, he has no life really, because this is tension. <laughs> this is more than fascinating. Trust me. I wish I had time to explain this to you, but how do you say that? How do you say that? Something existed there. What? Concentrate on this. Higgs appears, 
I'm very close to bottom and anti bottom quarks. So this particle interacts the most with the particles that have more mass. Okay? Top quark has more mass, but this particle cannot become top quark, it's just too heavy for this particle. For the is done. What happens is that when a Higgs particle is formed, let's say with 0.2% chance of probability, it decays into two photons. Okay? So, now, really high energy photons, which you can detect. Okay, that, that is the thing. You can say, photon has more mass, then how is it possible for a Higgs particle to decay to a photon? So, I will show you how. Okay? Here, with proton solutions, these are gluons, they turn into top quarks, it becomes a Higgs particle, and then top quark or W boson, then comes photon. Okay? So this is what is going on there. Well, I mean, this thing is virtual, that means it is, I said, you cannot really see it. But here, here, this Higgs boson, <coughs> when this interaction is actually around the energy of the Higgs boson, this guy becomes a resonance. Essentially, a short-lived particle. So there is a difference between virtual particles and resonance. Okay? This guy obeys Einstein's E equals, well, mc squared. In the, you know, with energy, that's it. E squared equals P squared, C squared plus N squared C to the power of four. This guy obeys this relation. These, these guys do not obey this. Okay, they are not virtual particles. So this is the process that people actually were looking for. They, they collided many of these things. Maybe in the first collision, this process took place. But how would you know? Right? You have to do it many times. Now, so I told you already this, I don't want to actually test my time. Uh, okay, maybe. If the energy of the colliding particle is just right, then you create a short leading particle called the resonance, then it exists. And the problem is the following. There are many things in phosphorus. You collide two protons, two photons come out. Most of the time, the reason is due to something else. Okay? Now, look at this bump. If you forget, forget about this bump, okay, the, the rest of the part is called the background. Meaning, if there is no Higgs, you will see two photons that come out with energies and so on in this, in this region. But if there is a Higgs, okay, and if you do enough collisions, there will be some excess, okay? Now, if you take lots of, lots of data, then you have a chance to say that some of these collisions, like 20 of them, came from the Higgs particle. The important thing is that you never know, out of that 10 to the 14 collisions, you never know which one produced the Higgs. Okay? That's important. Let's go back to the singing tape story. Okay? You essentially, you essentially, okay, I took your singing into a cave, I listened, and I did good with the analysis. I figured out that the person I am interested in is in the cave, singing, but I had no idea where he was sitting. Okay? That is essentially the thing that, that I can say. How sure are the people that do the job here? They say that out of five million, there is one possibility that the signal is not coming from the Higgs particle, but it's the background fluctuation. Since these are probabilities, in this many throws, okay, in this many throws, the background somehow fluctuated. It's pretty much like this. I throw a dice, okay, a coin, a coin, and I do it like 10 times, okay, I get nine head and one but that here, it's unlikely, right? But then it can happen, and the chance is one over five, five million. So we have this particle. The standard model does not predict the mass of the particle. That's the problem. Now, 
Uh, maybe there will be another theory, which will actually explain why, for example, the mass of the proton divided by the mass of the electron is about 2,000. Or why the particles have particularly that type of interaction with the field. Some that model cannot explain. Finally, okay, 1% of the atomic mass comes from the interaction, but that is crucial, I told you, for the existence of the atoms, for the appearance of the atoms. Okay? Now, sorry, I have no time for general relativity, but in general relativity, mass of an object or angular momentum of an object can be written in terms of the geometry of space time. This is another fascinating story, but it's a different story. You have a mass, okay, as a physicist, you measure something like this, and the mathematician comes and says that, okay, let me explain that mass in terms of the geometry of the universe, and he can do that. So everything in general theory of relativity, essentially, can be expressed in terms of space time. How does this fit into quantum mechanical picture is not really clear. It is urgently needed because, first of all, gravity seems to be separated far from the rest of the interaction. Okay? It doesn't have any quantum mechanical explanation. And also, if you think about it, mass is the only thing, you know, uh, that we honestly measure from outside distances. For example, the mass. But mass is the only property that shows itself, essentially, from outside, right? For large objects. So somehow, this fixed picture, the kinetic energy of quark and little combining energy and so on, must be related to, uh, must be unified in a theory where you have both gravity and quantum mechanics working at the same time with exact precision. That needs to be worked out, okay? And it is actually an open question. Okay, thank you very much. And if you have questions, <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, that was a very interesting talk in Parmacus. Any question? So recently there was an article work on the fundamental issues in quantum mechanics. For example, like what is what does psi exactly correspond to? Is it real or is it just a mathematical abstraction? Mm -hmm. So do you see if that work can have an impact on these issues in high energy physics? Well, it could. So you are talking about um, the reality of the yeah. way it yes. Well, it could, but I don't know exactly how. how it could. Uh, the problem is the following. The particles, okay, there are millions of problems, but just let me see one of them. In standard model, time is given as an external thing, which, which is not very really dynamic, time. In general, relativity, time is dynamic, okay. So, I think there's one big, big issue that has to be solved, okay. Then you will ask the question how the time started and so on. Quantum field theory takes, and quantum mechanics, takes time as an external parameter. For example, it's not an operator. Okay? In, in general relativity, time is very dynamic. How are they going to fit that item? Another thing is that in quantum field theory, particle exchange leads to interactions, if you like. In general theory of relativity, the curvature of space explains the gravitation. So how they will fit that I don't know. Another thing is, uh, well, quantum mechanics is essentially um, okay. But if you try to write down a Schrodinger-like equation in general relativity, you basically get the following: uh, the right-hand side of Schrodinger equation is zero. So h times r is equal to zero, and we have one universe. And in quantum mechanics, we typically have many probabilities, right? And writing down a wave function for the universe does not seem to be a problem. I think there are big, big issues here. 
even a practical the notion of a practical incurred space is a very tricky one which has not been settled. So I think it requires really brilliant young people to work. New ideas are really good. In other words, you is there any work uh, related with this for the graviton? The graviton? Well, so graviton, no. Uh, you mean like theoretical work? Yes. Okay. So, this boson, as I have actually shown, it's an extension of the Higgs field, okay? And uh, graviton uh, is not exactly clear what it is. So, um, it's supposed to be a small perturbation in space time, which goes like a particle, which is quite different than the Higgs, Higgs particle. So, it is a spin, it is. Um, it gives rise to different interactions. There is no immediate connection between them. Certainly, this particle interacts with the, with the gra gravity and gravitons, but since gravitons, we are so far away from gravitons, I cannot actually say anything concrete. Okay? There are theories to work, but there are unrelated particles. One of them is observed, hopefully. The other one is. There is no hope of observation. Forget the observation of the gravity. We have not been able to directly observe uh, gravitational waves, a collection of, let's say, almost infinitely many gravity. Okay? We know that they are there because the calculation and the theoretical observation of binary stars show that there is gravitational radiation. But on Earth, we have not detected. Gravity is actually so weak in the Earth. Any other questions? Well, two questions. Uh, you don't take end time mass, right? End time mass is positive mass. Exactly. And also for gravity, uh, we have uh, also in graviton theories, whatever. Do you also have a reaction of gravity, or is it something that's really Well. Repulsion, okay, there is a repulsion of, okay, the gravitational interaction is very com complicated. There is this uh, dominant uh, attractive part coming from the masses, and if the particles have spin, there is a little bit of, uh, how to say, uh, repulsion. But overall, overall, we believe that if gravity is right general theory of relativity, there is actually um, attraction. But one major thing, the universe seemed to be accelerated in a uh, it was the theory to the experiment we showed, as if there is some repulsive gravity in the universe. This this is related to the 99% well, 99% of the mass energy that we can explain. Some part of it, like 78%, 76% of it, is about the energy of the vacuum, which turns out to lead to repulsive gravity between galaxies. Okay? But we think of it as creation of space, and all the galaxies are expanding. So, massive objects, when they interact, uh, they attract each other. Okay, that, that is the thing. But overall, the universe could have a repulsive uh, expansion coming from gravity. And also, the tiny difference of repulsive interaction between the spins of objects. Okay? And, uh, in fact, what is funny is for light, for example, which doesn't have mass. It turns out, it turns out, this spin-spin interaction and energy-energy interaction for light is just equal to each other. And if light travels like this for a billion kilometers, okay, there is no gravitational interaction. If you reverse the direction, it turns out they affect each other. Okay? So two lights, parallel going light, do not affect each other or repel. But then, if you change them, 
their energy attack and their spins repulse each other, the weight they both attack. Okay? The other case, they will be Okay? Yeah. We have tea outside. We can continue informal discussion. Let's thank Professor Tiffin for the most